do. Um, as I said, the, the information in there will also include, you know, what Diana is wanting to do with the, the children's stuff during the summer. So uh, keep an eye on that. Communion is coming up in service. So make sure that you're ready for that. Again, if you're here in person, just go on down to the foyer and make sure that you got the, the cup with the wafer and the juice. And if you are not here in person, uh, I encourage you to go ahead and grab whatever you're going to use as the elements so you can be a part of that. And we can commune together in that and join together as we just celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which, as I mentioned every week, is why we do Sundays. That's it. That is why we do Sundays, because we have this great gift through Jesus Christ. And that's what communion is. It's just remembering that. Uh, moving on from there, um, I'm not going to talk too much about giving because uh, Ken's going to do that later. But uh, if you do feel compelled or inspired or led to give, we have three ways that you can do that. You can drop it off in the back. Um, in one of the one of the collection trays also you can send it in by mail or we do have an online option so if you uh, feel comfortable using that then that's uh, very convenient and very easy so we encourage that on our website we have a connect tab at the top and when you click on it it opens up a little thing and, and on there is prayer and we encourage you to do that and just go and let us know kind of the struggles and, and stuff that's going on that you wish for us to join in prayer with you in um, and if there's stuff that's going great and you you want to praise God and you want other people to praise God uh, for these things and the way that he's moving uh, you can obviously fill that stuff in there too but it'll it'll give you the option whether you want the all of the church to know or just maybe just the leadership whatever but we want to hear from you and we want to be in prayer for you uh, Wednesday nights is just now mic drop mic drop Wednesday night 530 on Facebook live just join our Facebook thing, and then if you click on the little uh, thing to get notifications, it'll tell you, hey, uh, Cedar Rapids Christian Church is going live, and it'll just give you a little button to click, and it'll bring you right to me. But yeah, we go, we start about 525, but we start the actual study at 530, and we're just going through Acts. Um, I don't know, I enjoy it. I hope you guys do too. Life groups. We have a Tuesday night life group that meets in person at the Thomas's house. Um, and that is at 6.30 on Tuesday night. So if you want to go to that, reach out to Al Thomas or Kathy Thomas or someone can give you the instructions to get there. But yes, um, meet with them and they're still meeting on Tuesday nights. Also, there is a women's Bible study here at the church on Thursday morning starting at about 9.30. So if uh, you are a lady and would like to join them and have that day off, uh, they would love to have you join them. But anyways, they are continuing during the summer. So there you go. Last thing I want to talk about Right Now Media and just uh, that this is um, something that we offer. It is, is something that you guys can use. It is a whole library of just Bible studies. There are some entertainment things in there. There are some entertainment things in there for kids. But if you just check on your bulletin, I believe on the back there is uh, instructions on how to sign up for it and how to get it. But um, this is nothing that you have to pay for. The church pays for this and offers it to you. So use it. Welcome to Cedar Rapids Christian Church. If you want to go ahead and stand with me and we will join, uh, start with prayer. Dear Holy Father, God, I thank you for allowing to come into your house. God, please um, let these sounds be pleasing to your ears, God, and just help us to remember that who you are and how great you are and all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Men of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Alleluia, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood sealed my pardon with his blood alleluia what a
Still my soul, the Lord is on the soul. Bear patiently the cause of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, be faithful. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways, he feels a joyful end. Be still, my soul.
this time of communion, we do want our souls to be still. And in the song prior to that one, we sang, Lord, I'll worship your holy name. In the New Testament, we don't have a lot of instructions on specifically around the worship service. We have instructions a lot on how we should live our lives, how we should conduct ourselves, but not a lot about how we should hold our worship services. And this week I was reading through um, the book of Exodus that I read through every few years, but uh, every time I read through it, um, the Old Testament, I learn a number of new things. And what struck me this week reading through was, uh, you know, we start out with the Ten Commandments when the, the Old Testament law comes, and those are pretty um, succinct and, um, and um, short. And, but then you get into uh, a lot of other things on... Um, legal matters and property, and then um, then uh, instructions on the worship service, and instructions on how to build a tabernacle, how to set it up, what it's supposed to be made out of, the various articles of worship, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant, the, um, the altar, the lampstands, uh, various things, on how, the sizes of them, how they're supposed to be constructed, what kind of wood, the overlay of gold, how they're supposed to be used, carried with poles, and so on, very detailed and very specific. And God was trying to teach the Israelites obedience. Obedience to show that if they were obedient, his grace and mercy and protection would be uh, overflowing to them. And also to warn them about the consequences of being disobedient and um, the punishment and penalties that could come from that. So, you know, as we contrast to um, here some 2,000 plus years later, we do have a few instructions for our time of worship, specifically for communion, and one of the passages, uh, or the passage I'm going to read for you, is one that is read um, fairly frequently up here uh, during time of communion, and sometimes it's mainly focusing on the first part of it, but Paul writes this passage as encouragement, but also some warnings to us on how we need to be respectful and honor our God through our time of worship. We don't have so many specific details like in the Old Testament, but the idea is still the same. We need, we're here to honor and worship our God. So I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is a this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Sometimes we stop there, but Paul goes on. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. As a man ought to a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Pretty stark warning from Paul there to the Christians in Corinth, but also to all Christians who read this, including us today. So we're here to recognize that, uh, I didn't bring it with me, but the little um, dispenser we have nowadays with the, uh, the juice in the bottom part and a little wafer on the top, that's not actually Jesus' body and blood, at least I don't believe it is. I believe it represents it, though, that we're honoring him by remembering what he asked us to do. Remember that he gave his body, he shed his blood on our behalf, and this is not just a ritual we do, but it's a way of honoring and remembering his sacrifice for us. And we need to do that in a respectful manner. And and not um, in a way that would disrespect him. So as we gather now in this time of communion, let's remember the grace and mercy of our God. And let us also remember he is the all-powerful creator. And without his forgiveness, 
we would not have the promise of eternal life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the Old Testament law that was a guiding point for the Israelite nation, Father, and for the obedience it taught them. And we're thankful for Jesus coming some 2,000 years ago, Father, and creating a new covenant, a new covenant which he gave his life on our behalf. And he simply asked us to remember him as we gather and partake of this time of communion. Remember that this bread represents his body, given totally for us, given on our behalf, given freely for us. And this cup of juice represents his blood shed on our behalf. So let's recognize what these items are for and their importance and their significance, Father. And we just pray that in this time of communion, we can honor you and respect you and fear you, Father, and the fear that draws us closer to you. So, Lord, as we partake, we pray your blessing, and we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. morning. Um, I've been asked to, to preach on giving today because Mike chickened out and decided he wanted someone to do it while he wasn't here. No, not really. But I don't really like talking about giving. And you know, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't even like to hear people talk about giving. Because usually what happens is it kind of goes along these lines. Well, you know, you need to start giving. Or 
If you're giving now, you need to be giving more. The church has these needs, and it's your duty as a member of this church to make sure you're giving, right? Well, I have a couple problems with that kind of talk. First of all, Paul tells us that our giving should not be under compulsion, but that we should be cheerful givers. In fact, the word in the Greek is, there is hilarious. Hilaria. And so, you know, the, the talk about, you know, it's your duty or it's your responsibility, that doesn't really fit with what Paul says. And the second reason I, I don't like talks about giving is because the only people who seem to be affected by those talks are, the, are those who are already giving. Those who aren't giving aren't going to start just because they hear a rousing sermon or even a half-hearted attempt. Um, the, <coughs> what happens is uh, that we, you know, so we have to ask our point, ourselves then, what's the point? Are we trying to squeeze more out of those who are already giving? Are we trying to uh, make them feel guilty and take the joy out of giving? Or maybe we're just trying to get those who aren't giving now to start giving. And as we've already talked about, that really doesn't work. So the problem with, with all these things is that we need to get a new perspective on giving. We need to have a changed heart. And so my approach today is going to be a little bit different than what you've heard before, maybe. But I think it's a godly approach. And so we're, we're going to be traveling through the Bible. We're going to start in Genesis and end in Acts. So quite a leap today. But... Um, we're going to be talking about a thing that God established, Creation Week. And, and the reason he established this was to help to teach us to trust him. Because I think that that really comes down to the heart of giving. That it's a matter of trust. Do I trust God will provide? Do I trust God will take care of things? Or do I have to do it myself and and, you know, make sure I hold a little bit back because, you know, you don't know what might come up. And God did this by establishing something that he called the Sabbath. And so Genesis 1.31 says, And God saw all that he had be made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. And then in chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their hosts. And by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he, <laughs> and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then the Lord blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had already made. And then over in Exodus, chapter 20, verse 8. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall do all your work, but, on the, seven, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, so you shall not do any work you, your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle leader, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. And so we see that in the, in the creation week that God created that Sabbath day, that day of rest. And we see in, under Moses' law that God said that we need to take that Sabbath day of rest as well. 
And so I guess a question we have to ask ourselves is why did God take the rest? Was he tired? No. He need a nap, maybe? No. Maybe he just need a break. No. Because God is not only the creator of all that is, but he is also the sustainer of the universe. He's not like like the deists believe that, you know, he he made things and he wound it up like a clock and then just sat back and let it run. No, our God is actively involved in his creation every day, every minute, all the time. And so it wasn't that he needed a rest. So why was it? Well, in, in the Genesis passage, we see that God did it so he could appreciate, so he could enjoy all that he had made. And really, that's the same reason for us. We need the time to sit back, quit struggling to, to make things on our own, and sit back and just enjoy what God has given us. And so... That's why he established that Sabbath day. And it's really all about trust. And so the question I guess I have to ask you then is how often do you take time out to just sit back and appreciate what God has done for you and to thank him in worship? Because that's really what Sabbath is about worshiping a God who's provided everything for us. So as fine as that is and as nice as that is, that's still not enough to build our trust. So in Leviticus chapter 25, we have something that's going to stretch their faith even further. Starting verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, When you come to the land which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord, and you shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyards. So God is talking to the nation of Israel, which is an agricultural nation. Their entire economy was built on what they could grow, what they could produce. And he's telling them, every seventh year, I want you to not produce anything. The land needs its rest. And so not only from Genesis, where every seventh day the people and the livestock got their rest, every seventh year even the land itself got its rest. And for a, for a people who were entirely reliant upon what they could produce from the land, that was a huge thing. It would be like us, you know, just recently during the COVID thing, um, the economy was shut down for a time while we were dealing with the pandemic. Well, imagine doing that for an entire year, every seven years. And then God goes on down in verse 8. You're also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourselves, seven times seven years. You shall have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall sound a horn all through your land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim a release through the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. 
so not only were they wrestling every seven years but on the fiftieth year they were wrestling not only on the forty ninth but also the fiftieth year and so you you basically had three years there without a crop and so the they asked the question then down in verse 20 but what are we going to eat on the seventh year if we do not sow or gather in our crops then I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth a crop for three years when you're sowing the eighth year you can still eat all the old things from the crop eating all the old until the ninth year when the crops come in and so you know their their question was well you know if we do that what are we <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to eat? And God's like, oh, don't worry about that. I got that. And so he would bless them with this bumper crop on that sixth year to tie them over until until the new harvest came in. And so I guess the question then uh, to us becomes, how far are you willing to trust God? Will you give up your security? Will you give up your comfort, your stubborn independence, your need to, to do everything for yourself and provide for yourself, or will you trust God in that? Unfortunately for the Israelite nation, they weren't very faithful in this task. In fact, Jeremiah says that the reason they had to go into captivity in Babylon for 70 years was to give the land the Sabbaths that they had missed. And so for you engineers among us, that means they'd missed 490 years. <laughs> In a long time. So, um, but you know, the, the point in all that is that when we when we are not faithful to God, when we sin through our lack of faith, that um, that opens us up to some pretty dire consequences. And so, you know, in their case, it was 70 years captivity. And in our case, you know, who knows? But are you going to, you know, hold on to your material wealth until... God does something to take it away? Or are you going to trust the God, the God who created the entire world just for us? Because, you know, God didn't need this world for himself. He didn't need the plants or the animals or the sun or the moon or the stars. He's, he's complete in himself. But he made it for us. And he made us so that we could have that trust in him and that trust would give us that rest, that Sabbath. So, um, turn my page here. <laughs> so then that brings us to the New Testament and the Sermon on the Mount. And you know, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wasn't satisfied with just leaving us with the law as it was written. He actually gave us more responsibilities. And he does the same thing here in Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 19. And so this is really what Jesus is talking about here is, is really his idea of Sabbath. And he no longer says that it's enough for us to trust God one day out of the week. Or even to trust God for one year out of every seven years. But he actually tells us that we need to trust God every day. And so he says it like this, starting in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on, on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so the first thing he does is he tells us not to be laying up our treasures here, not to be storing up all of our goodies here, but to be laying up our treasures in heaven. Well, that, what's that mean? That means that we have to live for eternity, not just for today. And so what we do with what God gives us and what God blesses us with is um, reflected in whether that builds for eternity or whether that just builds for our needs now. He goes on to say in verse 25, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink or for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he goes on to describe how, you know, he says, look at the birds. The birds don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, but God feeds them. And you're worth way more than birds. And then he says, and look at the lilies. They grow out there and they're, and they're clothed even more splendidly than Solomon in all of his glory. And they don't spin cloth and they don't work to get that. God gives that to them. And if God takes care of something that's going to be here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow to start your fire, don't you think he's going to take even more care for you? And so then he ends that down in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so, you know, again, he's telling us not to be worrying about those things, to just trust God to take care of us. And that's in, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, Mark actually gives an example of someone actually doing this. Down in verse 41. And he sat opposite the treasury and began observing how the multitude were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. And calling his disciples to them, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, and all the, the contributors to the treasury, for they out of their surplus put in, but she out of her poverty put in all that she owned, all that she had to live on. Now the way that the treasury was set up is out front in the courtyard there was a box with a hole in it. And on top of this there was like this brass funnel. And you know, people that, that were wanting to show off a little bit, they made sure they made lots of clinking and clanging in that brass pouring in the coins, right? Ding, 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 ding. So everybody looked over, wow! And, you know, here's this lady, and she has a couple cents that she throws in. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that little bit that she put in there wasn't enough to do anything anyway. She had already known going up to there that she didn't have enough for her next meal. But she also knew that God loved her and God would provide that meal for her. And so she thought in her heart as she was going up to the treasury, God's going to provide for me. I don't need to worry about that myself. And you know what? There might be someone out there who needs this worse than I do. So she puts it in. As Jesus said, it was everything she had. But her trust was fully in God, which is kind of the point of the whole story. And so really, 
what Jesus is, was getting at there was, was the secret of giving is knowing that God pro can provide so much better for, for us than we can for ourselves. Our responsibility and our duty is to give to help meet the needs of others and not worry about ourselves because that's the way God provides for his people by the generosity of others. And so then that leads us in conclusion to our last passage in the book of Acts. And as we look in the, in the book of Acts, we see that um, we see how this is lived out by God's people. First of all, in Acts 2, 43, through 45 and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many were and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had who believed were together and had all things in common and they began selling their property and sharing with all so that as anyone might have need and then in chapter 4 32 in the congregation, those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the abundant grace was upon them all. For there is not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each, such as any had need. A couple things that I want to mention in here is that, first of all, this isn't communism. Communism is where the ruling elite take everything and dole out to everybody what they think they need. That's not what's going on here. Neither is this a cult where every people are told to sell everything and give all the money to the church and basically ends up with cult leader getting ridiculously wealthy and everyone else getting along with what, what little they have. What's happening here is that the disciples of Jesus are from their own free will they're actually living out the year of Jubilee every day. They're taking all that stuff that, that God had provided, and they're saying, you know what, I don't really need this. And that guy over there can, can use his force than I can. And so they're um, selling what they have, selling those things that they don't need, and meeting the needs of those around them. And really, that's what giving is all about. Like I said, it's a matter of trust. It's, do you believe that God is going to meet your needs? And do you believe it so that you can let go of those things to meet the needs of others?